Many viewers of this channel, as well as friends who own Teslas, have asked me the same question. Why does battery charging slow down so much when Teslas and other battery-operated devices get close to 100% charged? I've answered this question personally many times, which made me realize, wait, I bet a lot of people don't understand why this is the case. If you're also confused about why batteries can charge so fast when they're discharged, but charge so slowly when they're nearly full, this video is for you. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So I'm gonna start off with a really simplified version of what a battery is. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to go into a lot of chemistry and so forth in this episode. This is kind of an overview, it's relatively simplified. So, you know, if you're a battery research expert, you're gonna be like, dude, you're not telling all the secret, you know, details. There are people who have PhDs in battery chemistry and spend decades working on this stuff. So I'm giving a generalized overview. I'm not getting into the nitty gritty of all the little tiny details of all this stuff because it is very, very, insanely complicated. What's that phrase, the devil's in the details? I mean, that's basically what it is. So anyway, I'm giving an overview here. I just want you to understand that. This is enough to understand why batteries charge quickly when they're discharged and slowly when they're charged up or almost charged up, but it's not getting into the nitty gritty details of exactly what's going on. All right, so anyway, that being said, let's start off with what is a battery? Well, a battery actually means a group. Like you can think of a battery of guns on a ship or something like that, but basically a battery in the sense of an electrical battery is a a bunch of cells. So the old, old fashioned batteries would have a little cell and then another cell would be on top of it and another and another and another. They're usually connected in series so that you get a voltage that increases as you connect each one of these things, but they don't have to be. They could also be a parallel battery. But most batteries that we know about are series-based batteries. So anyway, these batteries, whether it's an old AA battery or a lithium ion battery that's in your phone or a you know, really big lithium ion battery in your Tesla, produces enough power to power a device through a chemical reaction. So let's talk in broad terms about how a lithium ion battery in particular works and how it produces power. First of all, there's four different elements to any battery. There's an anode, a cathode, an electrolytic material, and a separator. Again, talking about lithium ion batteries particularly, the anode is where lithium ions and electrons are stored when the battery is charged. The anode in a lithium ion battery is mostly comprised of graphite, although extra things are put in depending on what kind of battery technology you've got. The cathode is where the lithium ions and electrons are stored when the battery is discharged, and often that can be lithium cobalt oxide, although other materials are certainly possible. And of course, as you might have guessed from the graphite versus lithium cobalt oxide, the anode and cathode are different materials, and that's very, very important. The electrolytic solution or electrolyte in lithium ion batteries is generally a liquid in which the lithium ions can flow. In other words, they kind of swim in this electrolytic fluid. And as you might guess, solid state batteries change this liquid to a solid. And by the by, as we're going to talk about more later, the electrolyte is extremely important. It's not a completely inert thing through which these ions swim, and this makes a big difference in terms of charging speed and why solid-state battery technology is touted as superior. All right, so that's the anode, the cathode, and the electrolyte. What about the separator? Well, the separator functions as a means of keeping the two things apart, right? The cathode and the anode apart. They can't really come in contact or you will short-circuit your circuit, and that is bad. <laughs> The separator is also crucial because what it does is it allows positive lithium ions to pass through the separator, but electrons cannot pass through the separator, which is why they have to take the kind of long road that goes through your car's motor or your phone or your laptop or whatever you're providing power to. And of course, that's basically how you produce power from a battery. It's also very important to note that lithium and electrons stored at the cathode are at a lower energy state than when they're stored at the anode, and thus there's a potential to produce power. So you can Think of it like a waterfall where lithium ions and electrons kind of fall from the anode to the cathode. The anode releases lithium ions to the cathode during discharge, or in other words, when you're using it. As you discharge a battery or use the battery, the anode releases lithium ions to the cathode during that process. The electrons can't go through the separator, so they have to take a wire through there, and you put whatever you want to get work done, you know, like a light bulb or something, in the middle of that wire, and it lights up the light bulb. During charging is backwards. Instead of having a light bulb there, you have some sort of 
power source, like an electrical source or something, and the lithium ions are released from the cathode and pumped back to the anode. And remember, that's a higher energy state, so it takes energy to push those ions back through the separator to the anode, and you're doing that by providing electrons, by pushing that with an electrical source back to the anode. And as I'm talking about this, I'm showing you this really nice department of energy animation that gives you the basic idea of how this all works. All right, so let's talk about discharging versus charging speeds. Generally, charging can be much, much faster than discharging ever can be. Unless, of course, you're driving a Model S Plaid, and you can see my video on that. It actually does use an amazing amount of energy all at once. All right, Jay, this is Franz. You're ready to go. Launch. Here he goes. Wow. 9247. Wow. But generally speaking, like you can imagine you would charge your car in say one hour or 45 minutes or something, but it could take three to four to five hours at the fastest to use up that energy. So you're charging it something like three to five times faster than you're discharging, which is why generally speaking, charging is the big issue with batteries. And of course, again, if you take like a phone, a lithium ion phone or something, you could use this phone all day, right? It should go 12 or 18 hours or something on a single charge, but you want it to charge back up again quickly when you plug it in. So charge Charging is usually more critical than discharging. Discharging is generally much slower than charging, so we don't really have to worry about that factor nearly as much. So I've come up with an analogy that I think will work for everybody, even if you're in the United States or in any other country in the world, and that's a football stadium analogy. So you can imagine European football or you know the rest of the world football or American football, it doesn't matter because we're talking about the stadium itself. So let's say we have a stadium that holds 50,000 people and it's completely empty, and you allow people to come in, there's no reserve tickets or anything, it's just find your seat, whatever, right? So as the people start to flow into the stadium, the first people can just pick a seat wherever they want, right? So they go wherever they want to, but as more and more people, so you get to like you know, 35,000 people, it starts to get a little more complicated. You get up to 45,000 people out of the 50,000 capacity, and it becomes difficult to find a seat. And those last few people, you know, 49,500, 49,600 or something, they have a hard time finding a seat. So they're having to look around for a long time. So that's the basic analogy. Essentially what's going on is the lithium ions at first, when they go from the anode to the cathode, right? So they're discharging or the cathode to the anode when they're charging, whichever direction it is. The other side is pretty empty and it's got a lot of holes where those lithium ions can go. So they can just find any place they want to go, no problem. But as the battery starts to charge up, in the case of charging, there, there become fewer and fewer of these empty holes, and it becomes harder and harder for the lithium ions to find those holes. And of course, that starts to create friction because the lithium ions are bouncing around trying to find a hole to go into. So that creates friction, which is why your battery oftentimes will heat up as it gets close to being full. And we can also push this analogy a little bit further. Let's imagine that we've got the 50,000 people, but they're all in an upper deck and a lower deck. So the lower deck is the discharge state and the upper deck is the charge state. So they've got energy, right? So if you're in the upper deck, everybody's sitting in the upper deck and then all of a sudden somebody goes like, go quick, find the spot at the lower deck, right? So everybody gets out, they go through the exits and they pour down into the lower seats. And again, whoever gets to those lower seats first just finds a place that they want to because they're all selfish, right? They're not like, oh, I'm gonna move over really far so everybody else can get in. They're like, no, nah, this is a seat, I'm good, you know, right? So everybody else has to work their way around these people, but they're losing energy as they do this because it's discharging, right? So they're, in this case, they're losing gravitational potential energy as they go down the stairs. But anyway, the first people get into their seats, but again, it becomes more and more difficult for those last people to find their seats. Then when we charge up the battery, the person says like, everybody move to the upper deck, right? So everyone's trudging up there because it's hard work because you've got to go up against gravity, so that sucks, right? But anyway, the first people again find their seats, but in this case, instead of a nice slow stately walk when you're discharging, they're like, run as fast as you can and find these seats. So people are just chaotically moving into this place. And so they're getting their seats and the last people again are having a very difficult time finding their seats. So again, when you're charging, when the battery is very discharged, there's a ton of seats, you can find your seats. And it's really easy to do. As it gets fuller and fuller, it gets harder and harder to find those seats, which effectively leads to friction because you've got, you can imagine human friction instead, right? Maybe people start yelling at each other and punching each other or something. It's a bunch of chaotic human beings. So it's, it's, we're pushing this analogy to the limit. But anyway, so you're creating friction and you're, you're heating up this battery or this football stadium, depending on what you want to call it. All right, and let's take this analogy to the limit. This is a very important point also. So let's say all of these fans are carrying junk with them. They're carrying cups, they're carrying coolers, they're carrying their jackets, they're carrying their umbrellas, whatever. They've got a bunch of stuff. And these are very, very sloppy fans. In addition to being chaotic, they don't really care too much about the stuff they've got. So if the going into the stadium is slow and organized, 
guys, they can take their garbage with them as they go in and as they go back out of the stadium. But if instead they're in a rush, right, where someone's like, you gotta run and get into your spot, they're gonna tend to leave their junk lying around and that's going to cause people to trip. It's going to cause fewer seats to be available because some of the junk's gonna be sitting on those seats, right? So it's gonna cause problems. So basically, if you're forcing these people into the seats too quickly and they leave their junk lying around, you're not gonna be able to, in the future to fit as many fans into those seats as you could, which in a battery sense means that the battery becomes degraded and you can't charge it up as much as you could. All right, so moving back to real batteries here from our football analogy. So early charging and discharging, again, though discharging is normally much slower than charging, lithium ions find any old home in the anode or the cathode when it's discharging. This is easy and fast, but as the charging goes through the later stages, the charging and the discharging, lithium ions have a harder and harder time finding a free spot, so things slow down. And of course, like I said, there's more friction, so there's a lot more heating at this stage. Thus, the fuller the battery gets, the slower the charging goes. Now you might say, well, let's just provide more power and force those things in there. And you can do that, right? So you can add more power to your charging and you can force the lithium ions to still go fast and get into there. It's gonna cause a lot of jostling of the atoms. It's gonna cause a lot of lost heat and wasted energy. But much more importantly, it starts to leave junk in the anode and electrolytic solution. And that junk is often termed tendrils. And these take up valuable spaces that the lithium ions could fill reducing the possible maximum charging and the battery efficiency. And it can actually be even worse if these tendrils get to the separator material. And remember the separator, all of these things in these pictures represent these really, really far away. But in physical terms, all of these things are smashed really, really close to each other. So you could have the anode, the cathode, the separator, and the electrolyte are all smashed into a tiny, tiny little space. And if those tendrils grow long enough, they can actually poke holes in the battery separator. And if they do poke holes in the battery separator, this can lead to a short circuit or a rapid rapid discharge, that leads to a lot of heat, and it leads to fire. And by the way, the electrolytic solution generally is flammable, which makes the whole situation critically important and very dangerous. Obviously, a runaway battery fire is a terrible thing, and if anybody remembers the Samsung Galaxy, whatever it was that caught fire on the airplane, that was a big deal. It's hard to put out battery fires because they're still generating energy because that short circuit is still going on until the battery completely discharges. So again, as many of you have heard about solid state batteries, what we can say is that solid state batteries have a solid electrolyte so tendrils cannot easily grow into the medium and generally the solid state is not flammable either so you can kind of force the battery to keep charging at a high rate even as it gets full which is why solid state batteries charge much faster it really doesn't have anything to do with empty charge capability because they're both very very fast when they're more or less empty but as the battery gets full you can force the battery to keep charging faster with a solid state battery than with a liquid electrolyte battery and I'm sure that makes you ask then well why why don't we just have solid state batteries? Well, they're very, very complicated. No one has built one that works really, really well at scale. In other words, that you can produce a lot of. So yes, it's probably going to happen. We'll probably end up with solid state batteries by 2025 or 2030. But in general, it takes a really long time, like 15 or 20 years from when you first get something that works to something that's commercializable and at scale. So by 2030, you might very well be driving a solid state battery car. But for right now, you're stuck with the liquid electrolyte version with all of its problems. So anyway, between the football stadium analogy and the understanding that, that liquid electrolytes are quite dangerous if you try to charge them too quickly and that you'll degrade the battery, I hope that helps you understand why batteries charge more and more slowly as they get fuller and fuller. All right, I hope you found this episode fun and informative. If you did, please like it so other people can find it. And of course, if you enjoy this kind of stuff, consider subscribing as well. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. You all are wonderful. I actually have a new Patreon shout out for two new patrons today. They are are Tomas Pizikolan, I hope I got that right, and Ut Vu. Welcome to both of you, and of course, if you're interested in joining, just check out the link in the description. Also, definitely check out the new shirt on our merch store. It's Physics is the Law, Everything Else is a Recommendation, which is a quote from Elon Musk. And of course, there's lots of other t-shirts, tumblers, mugs, etc., so definitely check it out. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock value valued at up to $200 and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how clicking on a link and going shopping for a car, a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. And as always, feel free to ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is knows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.